And as the children are heading out, let's pray together, okay? Dear God, we thank you for this time together here this morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth. God, help us to grab a hold of um, just the reality that your word is trustworthy and true here this morning. Father, encourage our hearts together. Grow our faith, we pray. And we just ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are continuing our study. Just began a new series, by the way, on um, just the questions of faith. And we come to yet another question here this morning. And um, coming into this uh, message here this morning, I want to share something to my own personal experience, uh, because this is um, maybe some of an experience that you've had as well. But this was a Bible given to me by my mother and father uh, just before I went off to college. Now you know how old I am, if you can read those uh, dates there. But actually given to me on uh, Christmas Day, December 25th, 1979. Yes, there is a year that old. <laughs> and so that Bible was given to me, and I was uh, encouraged by that because... Um, I knew I was going off to college, and I knew I probably needed God's word in my life at that time. I placed my faith in Christ when I was 12 years old. But honestly, I'm, I want to share with you that times were not always like real close with God during my high school years. And, and so anyway, I, I grabbed this Bible, took it to college with me, and lo and behold, it's like that first week I was invited to a Bible study in the dorm. I think, this is awesome. And so I brought my Bible with me, my new uh, Bible given to me by my parents. And, and can I be honest with you as well on this new first Bible study? I was praying. I don't know if I prayed that hard for quite a while before then that I would not be called on to read any verses. <laughs> Because you know what? I was not real familiar with the Bible. And I'm, I'm sitting here with the Bible and it's like, okay, don't call me, don't call me, don't call me. <laughs> and lo and behold, they gave me this um, little tab of paper with a verse on it. And I'm sweating it out big time now. And I go, where is that? Where is that? I'm going this and this and this and this. And I flipped and I flipped and I flipped. And I was trying to be inconspicuous because I knew my verse was going to be read here in just a little while at that Bible study. And lo and behold, I, I finally found the index in the front of the Bible. It's like, yes, page number and everything. Turn to it real quick. It's like, got there just in time before I had to read the verse. <laughs> you know, the Bible is an amazing work of God. A Bible is given to us by God himself, so that we might be encouraged in the faith and grow in the faith, and that we might come to know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, and that we might come to be assured of going to heaven forever. And so that began my journey in the study of the Bible, and lo and behold, I had no idea that God was going to eventually call me into ministry. And it's just an amazing thing, and it's like, Yes, I know my Bible much better now. But back then in college, I was like, whew, the sweat was pouring off my brow when that Bible study came. Well, we're going to look at the Bible here this morning. And, you know, this is one of those questions. Again, here's that, uh, that Bible and the verse, um, but, or the date, rather. So the question is, is the Bible really true, and is it really trustworthy? Is it really true, and is it really trustworthy? I mean, as believers in Christ, we, we bring our Bibles to church, or we bring our phones to church now. Maybe that's more accurate here. But, but we, we have our Bibles with us, and the question comes, can I trust it? Is it true? I want to share with you this morning that there are many reasons to believe that the Bible is true. And that it is trustworthy, and we're going to look at those here this morning, but I want to begin with this uh, verse, God's word on the matter, and we see right off the bat in Proverbs chapter 30, verses 5 to 6, every word of God, notice, is flawless, is flawless. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. There are three statements in this verse, and are in this passage. Number one, the Bible claims to be flawless, it claims to that God is a shield for those who trust in him. 
And it also warns about adding words to the Bible, which some people and religions have done over the years. But because of time constraints this morning, we're going to focus on that first claim today. The Bible claims to be flawless. It claims to be flawless. Now, according to dictionary.com, here we go. Flawless is this, having no defects or faults, okay, especially none that diminish the value of something. So there are three, again, statements in that passage. The Bible claims to be flawless, that God is a shield for those who trust in him, and that we dare not add any words to the Bible that God has given to us. So the Bible is, is something that's flawless. We can, we can trust it, but can we take God's word on it? Absolutely we can. Well, here are some evidences of why we can trust the Bible, why we can know that it is true. And the first one is this. The Bible is fascinating in its composition. We need to understand that. It's fascinating in its composition. You know, the Bible is made up of 66 books, uh, 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament. It's written, by the way, maybe you didn't know this, it's written in three different continents in three different languages over a period of 1,600 years by more than 40 authors. Now let that just settle in your mind for a second here, okay? Because this next statement is really profound. It remains one unified work without contradiction. How can that be? You have over 40 writers, all these different personalities that are involved. You have 66 books all together in the Bible, three different continents that it's written on, three different languages over a period of 1,600 years. And we can say that it's unified in throughout the Bible? Yes, it is. Absolutely. It's, it's incredible. How does that happen? This is only something that a supernatural God can do. You take these 40 plus authors, 1,600 years, three continents, three languages, put them all together in an amazing way, and the Bible's unified. In the Old Testament, it speaks of God's redeeming love and God watching over his people Israel and God making promises to the people and the nation that one day there will be this problem solver of sin in Jesus Christ. All through the Old Testament, you see that. And then you come to the New Testament, and here we go. Welcome, Jesus Christ, the answer to the world's problems. So the Bible is fascinating in its composition. It's also amazingly authoritative in its writing. You know, every book of the Bible was God-breathed. We we're told that, and we're going to look at those verses in just a second. Every book of the Bible is God-breathed, written by God-appointed, now listen, prophets and apostles are someone directly connected to them. Just real quick, we're going to go through this. Moses was the one who wrote the first five books of the Bible, often called the Pentateuch, okay? The writings of Moses were placed next to the Ark of the Covenant. Maybe you didn't know that. And by the way, this is an interesting little side note. For years and years and years, people said, Moses didn't write the five books of the Bible. That's crazy. Writing wasn't even invented then. People, they, they, they didn't even know how to write. Well, that all changed. The Code of Hammurabi was etched on a single tablet in 1795 B.C., 400 years before the Pentateuch was written by Moses. An archaeologist found that. <laughs> 500 years before Moses, or 400 years before Moses even came on the scene. Interesting, right? <laughs> well, we could go on. See, Joshua deposited a book that bears his name. Samuel wrote Judges, Ruth, and first, sec or first Samuel and deposited it. Jeremiah completed the books. Uh, and then Ezra, the scribe, compiled the books of Chronicles and co-authored Nehemiah. Mordecai wrote the book of Esther. Half of the Psalms were from David. King Solomon wrote Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, and uh, most of the Proverbs. And then the other prophets wrote the books bearing their names. So we see that God was behind all this and this authoritative nature of the Bible is very clear. You go with the New Testament. Almost half the New Testament books were written by the Apostle Paul. Five books written by the Apostle John, two were written by Apostle Peter, one book written by the close follower, Mark, 
And the remaining books, one was written by the Apostle Matthew, Luke, a close companion of Paul, wrote Luke and Acts, two others by Jesus, half for others, James and Jude, and then Hebrews was likely written by Paul. And you think, okay, that's, that's a lot of history there, <laughs> a lot of information. Again, I want to say every book of the Bible was God-breathed and written by God-appointed prophets and apostles or someone directly connected with them. You come to this verse over in Ephesians chapter 2. We're told, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens. The apostle Paul speaking to the church, the believers there at Ephesus. You are fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household. Built on, notice, foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. How did we get God's word to us? We got God's word from the apostles and the prophets. Authoritatively inspired by God to bring us God's word. And by the way, there's that verse I referred to earlier, 2 Timothy 3. All scripture is literally, this is the word picture, breathed out by God. Breathed out by God, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So God used these writers God used them and breathed into them exactly the words that he wanted us to hear in the Bible. This, this book is different from any other book. It's a God-breathed book, God-inspired book. He took the personalities of each of these writers. He worked through those personalities, and every word in the Bible is breathed through God. It's a supernatural work. Well, here's another incredible evidence. Did you know the Bible is incredibly meticulous in its translation? The Bible was written, by the way, in three different languages. Remember that? Hebrew, Aramaic, and also Greek. Okay. And then there were those who translated that Bible and, or I should say wrote that Bible down and wrote the words down year after year after year after year. And they were meticulous in their translation. Just, just let me uh, read this to you. Maybe you've heard of uh, some of these people, maybe you haven't, the Talmudim and the Masoretes, or Masoretes. Um, these were two people groups that copied the Bible for us so that we might no, the original languages, okay? Listen to this, though. The Talmudim is Hebrew for students. They shepherded the transmission of the Torah, the Old Testament, from A.D. 100 to 500. Listen to how meticulous they were. Synagogue scrolls had to be written on specially prepared skins of clean animals and fastened with strings taken from the clean animals. Each skin had to contain a certain number of columns. Each column had to have between 48 and 60 lines and be 30 letters wide. The spacing between the consonant sections in the books was precise, measured by, are you ready for this? Hairs of threads. The ink had to be black and prepared with a, spe a specific recipe. The transcriber could not deviate from the original in any manner. No words could be written from memory. The person making the copy had to wash his whole body before beginning. And the scribe had to reverently wipe his pen each time he wrote the word Elohim, God. And he had to wash his whole body before writing God's covenant name, Yahweh. Clearly, these scribes were meticulous, but it gets better, okay? The Talmudim were meticulous, but the Meserets, or Meseretis, were even more meticulous. Listen to this. They numbered the verses, words, and letters of each book, calculated the midpoint of each one. When a scroll was complete, independent sources counted the number of words and syllables forward, backward, and from the middle of the text in each direction to make sure that the exact number had been preserved. Proofreading and revision had to be done within 30 days to complete the manuscript. Up to two mistakes on a page would be, could be corrected. Three mistakes on a page condemned the whole manuscript. Wow. And by the way, 
Let me just give you a little bit of a chart to look at here. There were 24,000 New Testament manuscripts. 24,000. How does that compare to some of the other works that we know? Huh. You look at some of these works up here. You have Caesar. Um, uh, he had 10 copies, <laughs> 10 manuscripts. And notice the time span between writing it and when the actual event was, 1,000 years. Plato, seven manuscripts of Plato that are out there. Tacitus, 20. Herodotus, 8. Aristotle, 49. Homer, 643. But again, notice the time spans between the, the years there. We've got 1,000 years, 1,200 years, 900 years, 1,300 years, 1,400 years, 500 years. But then we come to the New Testament, only 25 years time span. Only 25 years. And 24,000 manuscripts. Incredible how meticulous these men were in writing God's word. That's why Jesus could say this in Matthew chapter 5, verse 18, for truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Isn't that amazing? How meticulous these, these writers were. Here's another evidence that we can trust God's word, and it's true. The Bible is absolutely unique in its character. This is really interesting. It's the single most published book in history. Did you know that? Nothing even compares close. We can look at some of these uh, famous works in the American Spelling Dictionary. A hundred million. A hundred million copies that are out there. The Hobbit. A hundred million copies. Truth leads to eternal life. This is from the Jehovah Witnesses. 107 million copies. The Book of Mormon, 150 million copies. Lord of the Rings, 150 million copies. Tale of Two Cities, 200 million copies. Harry Potter, 500 million copies. The Koran, Islam, 500 million copies. And then there's this little red book, this interesting, from Chairman Mao. They were indoctrinating the kids in China on communism. 800 million copies that they put out there. You want to know how many copies of the Bible are out there? Here we go. How many Bibles? 80 million. But I need to add this. Per year. Now how many are out there? We, nobody knows for sure, but somewhere between 5 billion and 7 billion copies of the Bible that are out there, that are circulated. Incredible, isn't it? <laughs> You know what that tells me? The Bible is making a difference in the lives of people. It's changing lives. It's changing hearts. And people can see the, the hope that's in the Bible, the hope of Jesus Christ that's in the Word of God. That's why it's so popular. Well, here's another evidence. It is wonderfully reliable in its science. We all know that the Bible is it's not a book of science. But you know, every time it does talk about science, it is spot on accurate. <laughs> Here's some examples. You know what people used to think? That the earth was flat. You know what the Bible said? The earth is a sphere. <laughs> and you know what we now know? The earth is a sphere. You could go right down the list. The number of stars, people used to think there were 1,100 of them out there. The Bible said there's a billion plus out there. You know what you know now? There's a billion plus stars that are out there. Every star is the same, people once thought. The Bible says every star is different. <laughs> you know what we now know? Every star is different. <laughs> well, let me go back here. Air has weight. The Bible says that. It used to be thought that air is weightless. You know what we know now? Air has weight. The wind blows in cyclones. The wind blows straight. The wind blows in cyclones. People once thought, thought that the wind blows straight, but we now know it blows in cyclones. Well, let's go on some more, just a few verses. This is interesting. The hydraulic cycle of evaporation, condensation, and precipitation. The Bible talks about that. For he draws up the drops of water. <laughs> they distill his mist and rain, 
which the skies pour down and drop on mankind abundantly. Can anyone understand the spreading of the cloud, the thundering of his pavilion? Isn't that interesting? In one of the oldest books of the Bible, Job, in fact, the oldest book in the Bible, we're told about the hydraulic cycle of evaporation, condensation, and precipitation. What about this one? The effect of emotions on physical health. We now know that that's a huge thing. But do you know that we're told in Proverbs 17, a joyful heart is good medicine, <laughs> but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. Let me give you one more passage. The spread of contagious disease. Oh boy, we all know about that today, don't we? <laughs> The Bible talks about that. The leprous person who has the disease shall, well, well, let me have to read it up here, shall wear torn clothes and let the hair of his head hang loose, and he shall cover his upper lip and cry out, unclean, unclean. He shall remain unclean as long as he has his disease. He is unclean. He shall live alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. In other words, he will be isolated <laughs> for a while until the spirit pass of the disease. The Bible, every time it speaks to science, guess what? It's spot on. It's spot on. Well, what about history? It's marvelously supported in history. This is interesting. Many have sought to discredit the Bible, but time and time again, they've been proved wrong. You know, the Bible talks about these people called the Hittites. Here's the passage. Exodus chapter 3 God comes to Moses and promise that I'll bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. Now this is really important, okay? Because this passage is a passage that God promises to Moses that he's going to bring his people out of Egypt. You know, if there's anything in error in this passage, it tells us that God is a liar, for years and years, there was no evidence of the Hittite people. None whatsoever. But guess what happened? <laughs> Archaeologists found something in 1906. An archaeological dig confirmed the existence of the Hittite nation. They confirmed the Hittite people, and they also confirmed the capital of the Hittite nation. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> well, here's another one interesting. Belshazzar. Was he a king? Really? Well, in the book of Daniel, we see this passage. Then Belshazzar gave the command, and Daniel was clothed with purple, and a chain of gold was put around his neck, and a proclamation was made about him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was killed. For years and years, they never found any record of a king. But guess what? Archaeology came through again. In 1956, archaeologists unearthed this and found that Belshazzar was the king's son and was in fact king. And you know what happened? <laughs> the king, at that time, went on an extended campaign going after enemies, and he appointed his son, Belshazzar, to be king while he was gone. Isn't this interesting? <laughs> Another evidence that the Bible is trustworthy and true. Finally, this is the one that is a huge one. The Bible is insanely accurate in its prophecy. Do you know there are hundreds and hundreds of prophecies in the Bible as you uncover them, and there are more than 300 just about Christ and his coming. Now think about this, okay? This is written by Dr. House Seed. Many of these prophecies were fulfilled before Jesus had a chance to read or act on them. For instance, it was predicted that Messiah would be born of the seed of a woman, of the nation of Israel, the tribe of Judah, the house of David, and in the town of Bethlehem, that the wise men would bring him gifts, and that the children in the surrounding area would be slaughtered. Now, no emphasis. Those are difficult prophecies for a baby to pull off while he's still in the manger. Isn't it? <laughs> but they happened around Jesus. Over 300 prophecies just on the first coming of Jesus to Bethlehem. Amazing. Proverbs chapter 22, 
This is one of the prophecies surrounding the crucifixion. But think of this. A company of evil do- doers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. Do you know Psalm 22 was written a thousand years before Christ came to this earth? And 500 years before we have any evidence of the Romans even coming up with this crucifixion. Crucifixion wasn't always around. It wasn't until 500 years before Christ was crucified that the Romans began crucifying people. That's incredible. By the way, one mathematician started doing the math. Are you ready for this? Here's the probability of even eight prophecies, just eight prophecies being fulfilled in one person. This is the probability, one and 10 to the 17th power. That means there's 17 zeros behind the 10. One and 10 to the 17th power. And he put it in words we could understand. You fill up the whole state of Texas with two feet of silver dollars, two feet of silver dollars, Mark one of them, stir the whole batch, (laughs) and take a person, blindfold them, have them go into the state of Texas, find the one marked silver dollar. That's the probability of eight prophecies coming true in the person of Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing? All these prophecies that over 300 of them just on Jesus' first coming. Well, we want to close with this, some beautiful truths. 2 Peter 1, verses 3 and 4. I love this passage. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, excellence by which he has granted to us his what? Precious and very great promises. You see, we have God's word, his trustworthy word, his true word, filled with promises that we can grab hold of. Let me share with you some of those promises. I just shared this verse with a lady this past week that had a scare of cancer. She went to the doctor. She was having some pain and issues. Um, The doctor said, you know what? It looks like bone cancer to me. Then she had a CT scan and they did the test that they needed to do. And we found out, and she was a little bit frightened. I would be too. (laughs) And I sent her this verse. Anyway, she told me, I'm going to read that again and again and again and again and again. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you uphold you with my righteous right hand. That's a promise we can grab hold of, a promise that we can trust because we know it's true. How about this one, Matthew chapter 11? Come to me all who labor and ever laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. How about this one, Jeremiah? The Lord appeared to us in the past saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with unfailing kindness. Do you know God loves you from eternity past to eternity future? He loved you before you took your first first breath. He loved you and will continue to love you even after you take your last breath. He loves you incredibly. Here's another promise. Stephen, here we go. (laughs) And we know that in all things, that all things work together for good to those who love God, who have been called according to his purpose. God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good, right? What about this one? James 1.5, if any of you lack, lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach and it will be given to him. And then we have this one, 1 Corinthians. Aren't you thankful for this one? Now you can also exchange the word temptation with trial. The word can be used either way. No temptation or trials that we're taking you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted or tried beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted or tried, 
he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Isn't that awesome? And here's another, tempt- or another promise. <laughs> if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from part of our unrighteousness. <laughs> no, all of our unrighteousness. Jesus is one that took care of every one of our sins there at the cross. Aren't you thankful for those promises? I want to finish with these two. John 3.16, again, would you read it with me? We read it last week. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And then this one, aren't you thankful for this one? You don't need to wander about your salvation. You can know that you're saved. You can know that heaven is yours. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. You can know that you have eternal life. Isn't that awesome? Aren't you thankful for God's word? It is trustworthy and it is true. We can count on it. Well, the musicians are going to come and we're going to close out with a song, such a great song. It goes perfectly with this message, Ancient Words. And as we sing this song, would you just thank God for his word? Would you thank God f- that it's trustworthy and true? Would you thank God for his promises? Would you do that? The so musicians come. <laughs>